Good morning. This is Teresa Alessio. Um, I'm the director of the Cairo Cytodiagnostic Center in White Plains, New York. And this is the second part of our six-part webinar series. And this uh, webinar is entitled Essentials of Thyroid Ultrasound. So by way of introduction, as I uh, am always going to be starting these webinars, um, I am the uh, director of the Cairo Cytodiagnostic Center, um, which is part of the Cairo Diagnostic Laboratory, which opened in 2013. Um, Sharif Ibrahim is the medical director, and he's a hematopathologist. This is a CLIA-certified uh, laboratory with a New York State license. The cytology division opened in May of 2014, and we constructed a cytodiagnostic center in June of 2014, where we performed ultrasound-guided spine needle aspiration biopsies. Um, for the, a certain relevance to this talk, I use a sonic touch, touch ultrasound um, to perform biopsies. I process smears, cell blocks, and immunohistochemistry on site. Um, previously, I was a staff pathologist uh, for a private laboratory, um, and I was also formerly the director of cytology at the Downstate in Brooklyn, New York. I received my degree from uh, Mount Sinai School of Medicine, where I also did my pathology residency. Uh, I did my fellowship in cytopathology at NYU, where I was trained in doing final aspiration biopsy, uh, and I am board certified in anatomic pathology and cytopathology. I have um, certification in ultrasound-guided FNA from the College of American Pathologists, and uh, currently my uh, endocrine certification in neck ultrasound is in process. So as I stated in the previous webinar, uh, there are many challenges in diagnostic medicine today, uh, especially in, this, in the uh, realm of uh, biopsy pathology. Um, oftentimes, uh, unsatisfactory or non-diagnostic samples are obtained um, because there are uh, no checkpoints uh, to look at the specimen for adequacy or preliminary diagnosis to make sure that there's diagnostic material at the time the biopsy is taken. So, um, therefore, some specimens, uh, you know, kind of fly under the radar and they get, they get processed and they turn out to be non-diagnostic and the patient has to come back for another uh, biopsy, which is not good for the patient or for the person performing the biopsy because um, patients do not uh, like this very much, obviously. And um, so that's one challenge. Uh, turnaround time is also a challenge. Um, so it, when a specimen is taken, uh, it has to make a trip to a third-party laboratory to be processed. Uh, sometimes there are delays in processing, which further delays the turnaround time um, with on-site uh, diagnosis, um, patients receive a diagnosis on the spot immediately um, at the time the biopsy is taken. So this, this results in greater satisfaction for, um, for patients and for the physicians who uh, obtain the specimens. Um, oftentimes, because there are so many uh, physicians involved in the biopsy where there's a physician that refers the patient, the uh, person who takes the biopsy, the person who reads the biopsy, and the patient. There are, there are sometimes there's poor communication um, because people just don't talk to each other. And this is um, increasingly growing as a significant problem in uh, medicine today. And also a lack of clinical correlation which um, we all know if the person who sees the uh, cells also sees the ultrasound, uh, there is better correlation, especially if the person who, see, who sees the cells sees the ultrasound and also sees the patient. By extension, the uh, clinical picture is more complete. So um, the integrated diagnostic approach to uh, management and diagnosis of uh, 
thyroid nodule is born. Uh, this is an optimal uh, situation where there is optimal clinical correlation, there is ultrasound correlation, and there is cytology correlation. So the person who obtains the specimen sees the ultrasound and sees the patient, thus completing a, uh, you know, a, a triangle of diagnos diagnosis. And um, therefore, all of these different uh, um, diagnostic clues are given and can be correlated together. Um, the specimen is triaged immediately, and uh, so no, no unsatisfactory or non-diagnostic specimens are seen. Um, samples can be taken for further testing, and the patient does not need to return for another FNA because all material is obtained on the spot. Um, and uh, the referring physicians receive a report verbally for significant and positive findings immediately while the patient is there. So um, for this integrated diagnostic approach, uh, I've developed a webinar series, which is going to be six sessions. We've already covered the first session in thyroid cytology last month. Um, today I will be covering ultrasound. And um, in subsequent uh, webinars, I will be covering molecular testing um, and interesting cases from our side of the Diagnostic Center to illustrate the work that we've been doing. Um, all the time, I will be incorporating the provisional 2014 American Thyroid Association guidelines for the diagnosis and management of thyroid nodules and differentiated thyroid cancer. So ultrasound guided FNA uh, can be performed in an office setting, in a clinic setting, and using a ultra, an ultrasound machine, which um, this is my ultrasound machine um, at our Cyto Diagnostic Center. It is small enough. It has a complete touch screen. Um, it is on wheels. It is uh, fully portable, um, and I have it uh, hooked into our uh, internet network, uh, well, our local area network anyway, and I can um, retrieve um, the images uh, from our server. Um, I use a linear probe, which is the probe that's recommended for um, small parts and especially for thyroid. I uh, took this picture just to illustrate that it's a straight linear probe and it's not curved um, in order to get the most surface area uh, in the neck. This is the probe that's recommended for um, thyroid and neck ultrasound. So just a little background of the history of thyroid ultrasound. Um, it was first noticed in the 1960s uh, that there was an application for thyroid ultrasound. Um, ultrasound was developed uh, in the mid-20th mid mid century, uh, the 40s, the 50s, uh, but it wasn't until the 60s when people started using started thinking about ultrasound and thyroid. Um, and this was a B-mode ultrasound as opposed to A-mode ultrasound. But the results were very nonspecific, and uh, it wasn't the kind of images that we see today. And patients had to have um, a much, uh, cumbersome, much more cumbersome process to undergo to obtain a thyroid ultrasound. In the 1970s, the AMOLT ultrasound could uh, distinguish between solid and cystic nodules. However, it was still not as accurate to tell benign from malignant lesions. With the advent of grayscale imaging uh, in the late 1970s, um, earlier, uh, easier interpretation of images were seen, and we could gradually characterize the ultrasound features of thyroid nodules, which I will go into. So, so as of the late 1970s, um, ultrasound was uh, emerging as a guidance method for finding aspiration to improve the accuracy of biopsy specimens. And what they saw was that the sensitivity and the specificity of biopsies improved dramatically, and uh, the incidence of non-diagnostic specimens in decreased by 50%, which is quite dramatic. By the 1980s, Doppler ultrasound was developed. And um, then uh, it can be seen, the uh, blood, throw, blood flow within thyroid nodules could be seen, and there was a correlation um, in assessing likelihood of malignancy. 
Doppler ultrasound is also useful in distinguishing Graves' disease from Hashimoto's, and I will uh, also continue with that. I have some examples. So today, um, there is an increased diagnostic value of ultrasound. Um, different uh, uh, different uh, methods have been uh, employed, uh, the use of contrast agents, tissue harmonic imaging, elastography, and Doppler flow analysis. Contrast is not really used in thyroid ultrasound. Um, however, um, tissue harmonics and uh, Doppler flow, of course, is uh, employed, and there is some limited um, use of elastography in thyroid ultrasound. But now, uh, ultrasound-guided FNA of thyroid nodules is now standard of care. Um, prior to, you know, recent years, um, thyroid ultrasound was not, was performed, but then uh, the biopsy uh, was performed without ultrasound guidance. Um, however, it has been now seen that um, it improves the accuracy of the needle placement because you see the needle actually going into the nodule. Um, and patients who have cancer uh, can be screened for suspicious lymph nodes and also biopsied at the same time. And now there are more affordable um, options for high-quality ultrasound systems, and clinicians can have them in their offices, um, whether you're a primary care physician, you're an endocrinologist, or a pathologist such as me, you can um, afford a, an ultrasound machine to have in your office, and it is quite useful. So just um, this is a very small uh, piece of background and the basic principles of ultrasound. Um, of course, ultrasound uh, is dependent on the speed of sound. Um, it is constant for a specific, a specific material, and you can see as opposed, you know, there's a different, um, different tissues in the body have, um, have different um, speeds of sound uh, based on their uh, relative acoustic impedance. Um, so the acoustic impedance is what limits uh, the sound from tra traveling. So um, say uh, air has the least um, and bone has the most. So, um, so but, but soft tissue is really what we're uh, talking about here, and the average speed of sound through tissue is 1540 meters per second. So sound waves propagate in a longitudinal direction, but they're represented usually by a sine wave. And diagnostic ultrasound uses pulse waves and periods of tra transmission and pauses where reflected sounds are received and analyzed. So the ultrasound machine will usually pulse three waves, and then it'll wait to hear back where the reflected sound will be received and analyzed. Um, and the acoustic impedance is defined as the inverse of the capacity of the material to transmit sound. Um, also, uh, impinging on or impacting on uh, sound waves is reflection, which is known as, defined as the redirection of a portion of sound wave from the interface of tissue with unequal acoustic impedance. So, um, so, and we can see some of these examples. Uh, it'll be better illustrated when I show you examples of, um, of uh, actual cases. So artifacts in ultrasound are very useful in interpreting the images seen. This is um, co in contrast to other imaging techniques uh, where artifacts can be a little bit more uh, confusing or distracting. Um, thyroid ultrasound employs many artifacts um, and aids in interpretation of the images. There are different types of artifacts. Um, there are attenuation artifacts where um, the signal gets um, attenuated or lessened uh, when, uh, as it uh, penetrates the tissue. Um, there can be um, shadows, such as posterior shadowing, which I'll show you an example of behind a calcified nodule. Um, there is enhancement or acoustic enhancement, which is a brighter signal behind a cystic or anechoic structure. And this occurs also in collared, collared nodules. There are reflection artifacts. Um, which um, 
usually uh, result in brightness. Those are seen as bright spots, um, such as calcifications within uh, a nodule or a parenchyma. And um, that also brightness or reflection artifact can allow you to identify certain anatomic structures, such as the trachea, which is mostly cartilage, which is going to be very bright. So as you can see, enhancement, you have uh, posterior en enhancement here um, behind a cystic nodule. So this is an anechoic structure or cyst, and you have this area of brightness uh, behind it. This is a reverberation artifact, uh, which is, um, we can see here, this is the trachea, and um, this is a reflection artifact. This is the area of brightness here, and this is a reverberation artifact um, that, um, that where the sound is penetrating and this brightness is reverberating. Um, and this is the trachea here, and this is the tracheal cartilage. This is the thyroid gland. These are um, the major vessels, carotid jugular, um, and this is the esophagus here, um, isthmus, uh, left lobe, right lobe. Comet tail artifact is seen uh, commonly in uh, thyroid nodules that have instated colloids. This is all, also known as the ring down or step ladder artifact, um, and this is where uh, you see um, colloid is making kind of this streaking um, within the nozzle. This should not be mistaken for calcification. Um, this is also known as cat's eye artifact, where the, where the um, instated colloid is, um, is uh, going down like the iris of a, of a cat's eye within a thyroid nozzle, and this represents instated colloid, also known as the stepladder artifact or ring down artifact. So um, many ultrasound features of thyroid nodules have been defined. I'm going to go through the um, through examples of uh, and definitions of all of these and um, the utility in diagnosis, the diagnostic utility of, of these nodules. Of these, um, of these features. So echogenicity is the first one. Um, this refers to the brightness of the nodule in comparison to surrounding thyroid parenchyma. So usually um, you can have different, types, different kinds of echogenicity within the same nodule, so mixed echogenicity is common in thyroid nodules. Um, you have hypoechoic, hyperechoic, anechoic, um, isoechoic. Um, and there are, there are different degrees of this, and sometimes this mixed echogenicity can result in a spongiform or honeycomb appearance. And this, can, this is very commonly seen in thyroiditis, Hashimoto's, or even Graves. Um, Hypoechogenicity is uh, commonly associated with malignancy. It's not diagnostic, um, but um, hypoechogenicity raises suspicion. However, in mixed nodules with solid and cystic components, the solid component should always be the one that's biopsy because that's what's going to tell you the answer. So here are some examples of uh, echogenicity. You have an anechoic nodule, which is a cystic nodule, again, the posterior enhancement. You have an isoechoic uh, structure here, which um, has the same um, echo texture as the uh, surrounding thyroid parenchyma. You have hypoechoic nodule, which um, is darker than the surrounding parenchyma, and then you have the um, hyperechoic nodule, which is brighter uh, than the surrounding thyroid parenchyma. Um, in Hashimoto's, you see a mixed echogenicity or a spongiform appearance. As you can see here, there's different areas of light and dark. It looks multinodular, and it's kind of a... Um, a different kind of echo texture, and the biopsy actually proved out to be uh, lymphocytic thyroiditis or Hashimoto's thyroiditis, where you have a mixed picture of lymphocytes and um, benign follicular cells. And there's even some degree of Herzl cell metaplasia. And these are um, some of the cytologic features uh, that I went over last time in the uh, lecture on um, essential thyroid cytology. Moving on to calcifications, calcifications can be present in up to 30% of nodules. 
Um, they're divided usually into three categories, microcalcifications, macrocalcifications,